Good morning, Minecrafters, and welcome to Season 2, Episode 9. Am I codependent? So, here goes. This is a... Codependency is a, is a big one to take on, and the reason is because it's so common. You know, often people hear the word, and, you know, they say, oh, not me, or the opposite. Oh, that's definitely me. And codependency could just cover such a broad area, which didn't used to be the, the truth. I remember back in... Um, well, when one of my parents went into recovery in Alcoholics Anonymous, they came up with something. It was actually around before I was 12, of course, but I believe AA came into being around 1940-ish. And then, uh, you know, it was realized rather quickly that the partners who then were mostly wives, now that's obviously different, um, also were having all kinds of symptoms of um, not then called codependency, but enabling due to their alcoholic husbands, again, then husbands. And now we know that's a much wider situation than that. So Al-Anon comic kind of came into play to uh, sort of help the spouses of alcoholics recover because obviously the entire family is affected by addiction. Now here's the thing. Now codependency, thankfully, there's there's been some light shed that it's far broader even than necessarily coming from an addicted family. Certainly, if you've come from an addicted family, there's a very uh, high chance that you probably have, you know, had some of these patterns develop along the way. And though now, um, again, we've embraced families that may not have had addiction because it can come from all sorts of avenues. So codependency is big and broad. And we're going to talk about it because it affects so many people, just so many people. So just to begin, because um, I wouldn't even say it's complicated. I just think that it's actually, uh, it can be complicated. It's just that there are so many definitions. I think we really need to kind of actually start narrow and go broader because I think otherwise the reverse would be very confusing. So typically with codependency, there is a need for control and or to be controlled. That's very basic. So there's often almost like a dance, like a an old fashioned waltz where there's a leader and a follower and, you know, one, two, three, one, two, three, like that. And there's the controller, the emotional manipulator and the control and the controlee or the one dependent upon the emotional manipulator. So both are codependent and that's just one way that it can look like. And I also want to um, say right up front that people often assume that this is only in romantic relationships. And we'll get to this later in our a little chat here, but that is absolutely not true. Okay. So we've got the controller, emotional manipulator, the controlee, who most people perceive as a codependent when really they both are. So there's often, not always, because this is one way uh, to be codependent, to have this need to control other people and their behavior. Uh, there's also, for some, a need to feel or they, they, um, sort of allow themselves to be responsible for the happiness of someone else, which we know can't, won't work. We can only, we're only responsible for ourselves and our own happiness. And then again, the flip side of that is sometimes people um, sort of uh, expect others to make them happy. Again, that won't fly. We can only, we can, we're the only ones that can make ourselves happy, whether you're partners or whatever. That's, that's just how it is. You know, and there's certainly some codependents who are very okay on some level, not maybe not consciously, okay, with other people treating them poorly or even abusing abusing them. Consciously, they may say that they know it's not right, yet they still allow it. So often the question is, um, you know, how come I'm attracted to jerks? And often people think that that's external, that, you know, we're just like a jerk magnet, and they happen to just be attracted to us. Well, no, we are attracting them, whether it's conscious or not. So often we'll break up with said jerk. And lo and behold, there's another one that shows up at the door just wearing a different outfit. You know, and of course, that's romantically speaking. And, and very stereotypically speaking, very stereotypically speaking, um, there are often parents who are missing something on the inside and then live vicariously through their kids, often through sports, though not always, and often through even um, 
teenager relationships when let's say she starts to become, you know, a, a, a beautiful young, young thing. And if mom is codependent with her, may be way too involved in what's going on in her teenage life, not in a healthy parent way, but in a way too involved way. Also true again with sports teams. We've seen it all, all too often where it's hockey mom or hockey dad or dance dad or whatever. And it, they're just, it's not the sort of normative or, uh, you know, healthy parental involvement, but every goal scored is about them or uh, dance competition one is more about them. So Melody Beatty, if you haven't heard of her, she's kind of, to me, she's like the codependency guru, though there are certainly more of them out there. And her book, Code- Codependent No More, um, has been out there for a very long time. It's kind of an oldie but a goodie. And she just has lots of good things to say about this. She says uh, one, one sort of very common denominator because this happens in the immediate family usually, right? It's how we've grown up. Again, myself, I grew up in an addicted family, which most definitely has this stuff going on, though it doesn't have to be. And she says that this common denominator, um, there t- seem to be um, some unwritten or silent rules that usually develop in the immediate family and set the pace for relationships. Silent rules. That is so true. These rules prohibit discussion about problems. They can, uh, or open or, or open expression of feelings, or and open expression of feelings, direct, honest communication, realistic expectations such as being human, vulnerable, or imperfect. You know, here we can also see the tie in with shame because codependency is very based in shame, right? And so Melanie Beatty talks about, you know, basically. As children, we didn't feel safe being vulnerable. And, you know, vulnerability gets a a bad rap because really there can't be a strong, healthy relationship without allowing ourselves to be vulnerable, right? So instead we remain guarded, um, which can also be a part of codependency and certainly part of being an adult child in an addicted family. And, of course, perfectionism in and of itself is largely based in shame. Right. You know, striving for that bar that, you know, can't be reached. And even within a certain context, if we reach it, is all we're doing is checking a box. Right. Nowhere to go but down. You know, perfectionism is really it's just incredibly abusive of the self. And I I believe it was Ann Wilson Shave. I'm actually not looking at that right at this minute. I believe she's going to said perfectionism is self abuse of the highest order. And that is extremely, extremely well said. You know, so obviously it makes great sense if we grew up in a family where it was very, very difficult to make mistakes, which we all do as human beings, in a safe way, you know, where there could be a conversation, of course, maybe consequences, and but healthy consequences that kind of, you know, suited whatever the mistake was. And definitely the talking about it and and that wraparound and redirection of behavior. And if that were missing, then it's not a, you know, a huge surprise that we learned to um, be intolerant of our own, our own imperfections. You know, and of course, all of these feed into um, developing issues with trust, right? Because if we can't trust that we will be accepted by our parents unless we're perfect, that's a big problema that, you know, follows us right into adulthood. We need to be able to trust that it's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to say how we feel. Again, even if, even if there's a consequence for mistake making, we can still trust that, the, that there's a love wrap around that's in our best interest. You know, I, I think of that, that, this is so stereotypical, that mom in the minivan who's prides herself on being everybody's everything and picking up everybody's kids and bake while well, baking brownies for the PTO each time. And, and again, good person things to do individually. And then she often gets resentful when people aren't, aren't thanking her enough. They're not, they're not noticing that's mind less giving. The goal of that giving is not authentic and inauthentic giving is exhausting and depletes our, our natural energy. And then, you know, the real kicker here 
is a codependent often thinks it's other people. You know, she or he's compulsively caretaking. Obviously, caretaking is, is a good person thing to do. Yet when it's at the expense of ourselves, I'm not saying, you know, a little inconvenient at times, taking care of an elderly parent or something like that. Obviously, there's going to be times when it's not easy. And thankfully, um, you know, good people are willing to go out of our way. And that's a good thing. We're not saying that. It's when it goes past, way past that, where we've depleted resources and really the payoff in it is the look at me, what a good person I am. That's the part that's not healthy because mind full giving is rejuvenating. Mind less giving depletes our energy sources. And though, you know, there have been so many definitions of <clears throat> codependency from way back you know, in the 40s when it was more called enabling, right up to the 70s, it was still called enabling. And now, you know, a broader term of codependency. Though there is no short and sweet definition. You can find lots of them. In short, basically, kind of, sort of, okay, it's about allowing someone else's behavior to affect us. And um, we often can get obsessed with that behavior and how it affects us. And we can often try to control that person's behavior, though it doesn't have to be that, right? We've explained the other ways that codependency can, can sort of manifest. However, that's, that's, you know, sort of common. You know, another one she talks about here, which is a big one in addictive families. And again, it can be a dysfunctional family, you know, without the substances or, or behaviors or whatever. Um, but uh, when we're not allowed to express our feelings in a safe way, and so typically the positive emotions are welcomed, right, most of the time. So it's anger's a biggie. If we weren't allowed to express anger and frustration is usually kind of a direct route to anger. So if we weren't allowed to, to express our frustration and anger in a safe way, with, you know, patient parents or caregivers, then again, it's no big surprise that this kind of follows us into our adult rate relationships where we have a very difficult time expressing frustration and anger specifically uh, for fear that if we do, something really bad's going to happen. Uh, so it's also important to know that another sort of common component to codependency, remember it has lots of different faces, um, so one of them is, you know, a pretty huge desire to change someone. There's the, um, the serenity prayer that you hear in 12-step programs, which goes something like this. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. You know, and obviously, you know, we're talking about a romantic partner or whether it's an, you know, an adult person with an adult parent or whatever like that is we obviously want to, you know, love and appreciate that person, you know, for exactly as they are, as, exa as exactly as they are. And also the other thing is when somebody's being irritating or annoying, you know, um, my best friend from growing up, I'd bring up a lot. She's often, we say to each other, um, so just, you know, you got to change your dance. You got to change your own dance because when it comes down to it, right. The only person we can control is ourselves. So whenever possible, you know, thinking about moving, moving the attention over back to ourselves and how we can change our dance to respond to whatever it is that's annoying is a much better plan most of the time. I mean, wow, if that isn't spot on for life, I don't really know what is, you know, and often I have this talk with, well, definitely with our adult, young adult children and also with my students, though, um, you know, we usually talk about locus of control and making columns, especially in Minecraft and also positive psychology. You know, when you have something going on in our lives, just to separate things into columns, right? So what are the things I know I can't change? What are the things I can possibly change, right? And then looking them over, and figuring out, you know, <laughs> the wisdom to know the difference. What do I actually have control over? This is very important for one's mental health. You know, and it's it's really important that if you're starting to, you know, have some light bulbs going on, like, ooh, I do that, ooh, I do that, oh, somebody I know does that, I'm in a relationship with somebody who does that, to realize that the idea is not to jump on the on the shame campaign, right? Hopefully 
you Minecrafters out there are on an anti-shame campaign, right? Because shame is about feeling defective and flawed in some way. And that's, you know, the polar opposite of what we're trying to do here. And to just realize that, you know, this doesn't mean I'm a bad person. It doesn't mean I'm defective. It means that I'm, I'm becoming aware of some things that maybe aren't working for me anymore. Some things just aren't working for me anymore. And, and I'm thinking about changing them. You know, realize too that many of us learned these unhealthy behaviors, you know, as little kids. I mean, what, how much can be your fault, be your fault as a little kid, right? And then we continue to perform these learned unhealthy behaviors to protect ourselves, often to just, you know, survive the chaotic environment we were living in. So, um, Melody Beatty talks specifically about the caretaker. Again, there are lots of faces for this. So if this one isn't you, hang on. If this is you, definitely hang on. Codependents who kind of manifest this in a, you know, caretaking role, um, she says they, th- they often think and feel responsible for other people, for other people's feelings, thoughts, actions, choices, wants, needs, well-being, lack of well-being, an ultimate destiny. Destiny. Think about that. That's a lot of pressure on someone. And, you know, we can often learn that as little kids when, you know, mom passed out on the floor and we had to learn that, you know, at six, we had to be the mommy or, um, you know, ca- caretaking emotionally and, you know, and a parent. And we learned that we had to, you know, it was all on our shoulders kind of thing. It's no huge surprise when that follows us into adulthood. It's no big surprise at all. Sometimes the the codependent caretaker from, can feel compelled, almost forced, to help that person solve a problem, such as offering unwanted advice. I think we all know those people, right? Giving a rapid fire series of suggestions or fixing feelings. Often codependents can be fixers, not so much the active listeners, but the fixers. This is one I've seen a lot in romantic relationships when, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm particularly thinking of women. It can be men. It can be anybody in between, whatever. I, the ones I'm thinking of are women attracted to, to, um, to partners who were, you know, needed to be fixed. They're basically train wrecks. They're walking around with all kinds of stuff going on. And it was her job to be in this relationship with him or her or them and, and fix this person. And what's interesting is I've seen it happen many times is the person, the partner kind of rises to the occasion, actually. It kind of, quote unquote, gets fixed, you know, I, you know in that kind of way. Like they, their life improves somewhat from this up from the codependent being in it. Then guess what? They're no longer exciting. They're no longer attractive to that person because they're doing too well. That this is very, very common with that fixing or rescuing thing in a romantic relationship. And then, of course, she or he or they move on to the next future partner who is in need of being fixed. Codependent caretakers can also feel angry when their help isn't effective or even being received well. When they want to help. They're on a mission to help. They're on a mission to rescue, and they want the rescuee to be compliant and be okay with being rescued or fixed. Sometimes uh, the codependent caretaker can feel anxiety, pity, and guilt when other people have a problem. Okay, These are definitely empaths for sure, and empathy is a great thing to have. And like anything, even, even blueberries, right? Blueberries we know promote longevity. People often live longer lives than they eat blueberries. They're healthy, antioxidants, all that stuff. And think of it too much of a good thing. Too much blueberry, too many blueberries, too many blueberries gives you diarrhea. Empathy is a really good thing. And when an empath is feeling every single thing that walks in the room, other people's anxiety, other people's guilt, other people's this, that, and the other thing, that's kind of like emotional diarrhea, I would say. As Melody explains, um, the codependent caretaker often thinks that that he can anticipate other people's needs too and then often wonders why others don't do the same for them again remember that shame is involved here the ego is definitely involved here also looking for reassurance and approval and approval for being that good person and all this other stuff 
And of course, the people pleasing, I'm sure most of you have heard that term, phrase people pleaser. There's ways to people please and caretake, caretaking is also one of them. And remember, within, you know, within the bounds of appropriate caretaking, that's a good person thing. We're talking about the motivation here is, is different. It's coming from a different place. So as far as people pleasing goes, like the codependent caretaker um, is also very much focused on pleasing others instead of themselves. Big focus on pleasing other people. And, and th this crew is sort of unaware of what they want or need a lot of the time. Or if they are, they'll find a way to tell themselves or rationalize that what they want and need isn't really important. Or actually should say diminished, diminished sense of value. I don't want to say lack. That just makes it sound so absolute. There's definitely a diminished self-value there. They also often feel they're safest when they're giving, right? And then often feel insecure or guilty. They just have a, they have a hard time when, when somebody genuinely gives back to them. And obviously that's because they're not valuing themselves. Codependents have had injury done to them early on. And there's shame there. And they often, underneath it all, are, are there, there's been a shift. You know, they question their own value. And this behavior is, is really stemming from a, a lack of, of valuing themselves. You know, yeah, guess what? About the same time, they, they feel sad or even mad because they spent their entire day or month or year or lives giving to other people. And they're resentful because nobody gives to them. And as we mentioned, uh, they find themselves attracted to needy people, and needy people are attracted to them like a magnet. It's like they can smell each, smell each other. Remember, we said there's often a, often a dance, and it looks different because there might, again, there are different ways to be codependent. With the, this, the caretaker and the caretakee, they are definitely in a dance, just like the old fashioned waltz, and one is leading and one is following. This, uh, the codependent caretaker also kind of needs a crisis. They need, you know, some kind of drama going, you know, on where they can swoop in and, and rescue. And as if they, if they don't have that, they often don't feel alive. They might glom onto somebody else's crisis or kind of maybe unconsciously even create one. And they'll also, they'll often, uh, uh, you know, abandon their own, um, not just routine, but their own personal responsibility for something to zoom in and rescue somebody for something else. They're often, often overcommitted. They often are running around like gerbils on crack, you know, feeling pressured and, and hurried. And they're, they have a, like a deep belief inside that other people are somehow responsible for them. That's a little bit of the irony there. You know, and, and lastly, as Melody says, these, these people, they're often angry. I want to say like resentful, really victimized, like poor me, unappreciated and used. The, the, the caretaking codependent feels, or codependent caretaker, feels like a dish rag. And they're comfortable being a dish, dish rag, though they're resentful for being a dish rag, if that makes any sense. And again, th this is to explain, to bring about awareness, and certainly not meant to judge anybody. Because remember, all this starts when we're one, two, three, you know, way, 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 way back and then is continually, re continually reinforced in a dysfunctional family. And, and then that child, and then older child, and then teenager, and then young adult and adult just have, have, have solidified these patterns for so long that it's difficult for them to know anything else until they become aware. So the idea is to become aware and then, you know, pat yourself on the back when you have a light bulb moment. And that, you know, when you make a decision to make a change, rather than looking backwards and saying, oh, what's the matter with me? That's not what we want. Instead, what can I become? What can I can become my best self now? I've got some awareness. I've got some awareness of what's not working for me anymore and, and a visual for how I can have a better, more authentic life. That's what we're after. And as, as I think I've mentioned in maybe previous episodes, my least favorite children's book, I think it's my the only children's book I can think of that I don't like. And I actually just, it's not just a dislike. I absolutely despise it. It's a horrible thing to say about a children's book and is the giving tree. 
Um, the Giving Tree, I, I just I think it's by Mel Silverstein, I think. Anyway, uh, I, I can't stand that book. So it's about, um, you know, there's a tree and it's meant to symbolize the mom, this big, beautiful tree. And then the child comes and needs this, needs a branch, needs the fruit from it. It's using it for shade. And the, it basically the story is the tree keeps giving, 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 giving. You know, the shade goes because it cuts off its branches. It gives up its fruit and it goes through the whole thing, gives them wood to build a canoe or something. I, I forget the whole thing, but just completely gives everything she's got down to nothing. And at the end of the book, sorry about the spoiler alert, the adult male that, you know, from the little boy he started out as the adult male is using her. All that's left of her is a stump. And that is meant to be this, you know, altruistic. I don't know. In my opinion, I think instead of the giving tree, it should be renamed codependency for kids because that's really what it is. I mean, there, there's no, there's no honor in being a stump. There just, there just isn't. And, um, very, very unhealthy codependent stuff. We can be a healthy mother or father, a very healthy, life-giving, wonderfully caring, big-hearted, protective, fun parent without letting yourself get down to a stump where you are therefore not good for anything but sitting on. It's just such a bad story. Bad, bad, bad. So now, since codependency is a rather large topic, uh, and I want to keep it digestible, we'll definitely do a part two, and we will get to the, the positives and the what to do's and all that stuff, just as we have always done all the way through. However, because codependency has so many different ways to manifest, it just looks it looks differently in different people. I'm gonna feel more, you know, comfortable and, and fulfilled, I guess is a way to say with you know, kind of covering so that all of you um, who are interested in this can, can you know, really uh, have, a, have a full landscape of what codependency looks like. So I'll do a part two of this, and then we'll work into the what to do part, because we got to talk about the narcissistic injury, and that's good. There's a lot there, okay? So, so on that note, I will say thank you, Argentina. Muchas gracias por escuchar Argentina. Okay, and I want to thank all my Minecrafters across the United States and world for listening to this podcast, and I'm very hopeful I see you for the next one, or actually know that you're listening for the next one and feel your presence there. And this is Kimberly Quinn signing off from Northern Vermont. Have a mindful day. Mm -hmm.